Good morning, church. Let's all be standing as we start our worship service. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice. and welcome. What a joy to be here today. I'm just kind of curious how many of you stepped out the door and said, nope, I got to go get a jacket this morning. Anybody, anybody in that classification? I have to get a throw, something like that. Well, I, it's true. You got up and headed out the door when the sun was up. One of those great things. But man, we don't have a season of fall necessarily, but every once in a while we get a day of fall and somebody needs to say hallelujah for a day of fall. It is wonderful to be here. Paula, can you see me better today? Okay, Paula got cataract surgery, and so I know that she can see me better. And we're thankful that you're here today. Y'all welcome Paula back to, for this Sunday. <laughs> Certainly do. Glad to have you. Well, we're glad that you're here today. Glad that all of you are here today. But want to extend a particular welcome this morning to those of us, those of you who are guests today. We're glad that you came to join us. We would ask, we would hope that uh, we could be a blessing in your life. Hope you've already been blessed by a greeting today. Hope you've already been blessed by our opening song. And, and as our service unfolds, I hope that you hear the call of God in the midst of that. But we would also like to extend that blessing beyond this time. And so we're asking that you would take just a moment to pull one of the blue guest cards that you'll see in that rack on the back of the pew just in front of you. There should be a pen handy right there. And if you could fill out as much of both sides of that card as you're comfortable with. Again, our goal is to extend the blessing of this hour into the rest of the week and, and the weeks ahead. And so I would invite you to fill that out. During the, during the middle of our service, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper as we do every week. We see that as a, a biblical call and we follow in it. And uh, following the Lord's Supper, which is open to all believers, we invite our, our church family to make their regular gifts to giving back to the Lord uh, at, at what we call the collection. As one of our guests, we don't in any way want you to feel obligated to make a monetary gift, but we would greatly appreciate it if your gift to us today 
would be a card that's partially or fully filled out and just place that in the collection tray as it comes by. We very much appreciate having it. We're glad that you're here today and we invite you to come back and be with us anytime that you possibly can. It is our hope, again, that God would call to you today, that you would hear His voice today and that His, His great gospel, His word of salvation and redemption might come uh, to your ears and to your heart and to your life today. We're glad that you're here. A couple of announcements that we want to be sure and make. Be sure and grab a copy of the Caring and Sharing. You'll see a number of things there that you'll want to be sure and take a look at, particularly an updated prayer list that needs to be there. Robin will have a couple of updates to that at the end of the service, so always be sure and stay and keep your ears open for those last-minute updates. But I also want to make you aware that two Wednesday nights, not this coming Wednesday night, but the following Wednesday night, will be our annual uh, uh, family family Thanksgiving feast with our Sunshine School. It is a great opportunity. One of the great outreaches of this church is the Sunshine School. It's having a, uh, one of the best attendance years that it's had in a very long time. More children, more families, and therefore we need more people to, to love on them and care for them and again kind of uh, be God's blessing in their life when they come to our building on that Wednesday night. But uh, let's be real practical. Uh, we also are at, at needing, needing enough food to feed all those people. There are sign-up sheets back here as you head out the doors. It'll be on your right. Please take a look at that. Please, uh, even if you can't be here Wednesday night, if you could contribute to that meal. But, but more than that, really, I do want you to think in terms of planning on being here on that Wednesday night. Again, uh, it is our opportunity with those families, not just those children, but those families here with us in our building to experience our blessing. And I hope that you can be part of, of delivering, and again, not just our blessing, but God's blessing into their life for that event. So again, the sign-up sheets are up there. Head out to your right. Don't miss that. And, and Robin, be sure and remind them on their, on their way out. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Can't do it without you. Need your help to pull all that together. We are blessed to be the people of God. Amen? We come together in this place, not because uh, it, it's a, a great social club to be together with, not because it's, it's the, the thing that we want to do, uh, because it somehow or another is going to enhance our, our, our retirement or our well-being or, or something in, in the sense of financial well-being. We come together because we're the people of God. And God has called us here to give a word of, of encouragement to us and for us to have the opportunity to give back to Him, to give back song, to give back our attention and in, in, a, in a special form of our love that is to hear His word proclaimed to us today. He is the God who has said in the last moment, as, as, the, as the world comes to its great and final climactic conclusion, I will be there. And you will be changed. And you will be changed to be with me. That's something worth pointing to. That's something to worth hoping in. That is something that's worth celebrating. I invite you today to be a people to celebrate the great God who's going to change us. Why don't you come together, stand and sing. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. My fear is crippling, you are true, you are true, even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing, you are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting.
I'm sitting there going, and it kind of got to me a little bit, so sorry. <laughs> mm. I won't apologize for it, but it was just a, a neat time between me and him. <laughs> Lord, take my life. Father in heaven, how hallowed and majestic is your name in all of creation. And Father, of all of the things you've created, you've created us. Us with eternal hope that we can spend eternity with you. Lord, 
for all of the, the lessons, the food, the clothes that we wear, the home that we have, and all of the other things which are so many, Heavenly Father, that you've blessed us with. Especially, Heavenly Father, all the wonders of nature around us as we view in the beautiful beauty of the world. Father, you've given us so much. But that greatest gift that could ever be given, send in your only son, Jesus. Jesus coming to earth, living among men, and offering his body as a living sacrifice and shedding his blood for the remission of sin, that we might have this great hope of eternal life with you. Our Father, leaving us the Holy Spirit to guide us, which you have instilled in us from the beginning. Father, we ask you to be with us and guide us in our lives. Help us truly to be a, a human sacrifice of our body to you and doing all of the things that you would have us to do. All the, the various things that we do in this life, Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for this congregation, for all of the work, for our leadership and for our elders and for Alan and Peter and the work that they're doing and all of their families. Father, we ask you to we embark upon this new program of, of trying to make a better place to worship you, that we do this for your honor and for your benefit and for your glory, Heavenly Father. And Father, help us to continue to, to grow closer to you each day we live. With our missionaries, Heavenly Father, be with each of them in their work throughout the world. And for our sake of the congregation, Heavenly Father, may they improve and be with each of them. And Father, remember again that we are only here for such a short time to spend eternity with you. Father, again, we ask you to guide us in all that we do, to take our lives and mold them after your way. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we turn our hearts and minds to the bread and the cup this morning, I want to go back to a time after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, uh, after Jesus returned to his apostles and then was taken to heaven, and even after the Holy Spirit had come to the apostles, to the time when Peter spoke the first message or the first sermon to a new body, a new church. And it spoke of a new promise from God where we have grace and forgiveness of sin through Jesus, a new hope through Jesus. And in that message uh, in Acts 2, 38 through 39, this is part of what he said. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This message is a message that we today respond to, and it transforms us to live a life dedicated to God. And as we take this bread and cup, and cup we remember that sacrifice, that transformation, um, and the sacrifice that saves us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for all your many blessings, and this morning we turn our hearts and minds to your son Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross to die for our sins, to give us salvation, and to give us grace. And we give thanks for that, and then Remember him as we uh, break this bread. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Lord, we come again to you as we take this cup and remember the blood that was shed on the cross and the blood of a sacrifice that cleanses us from our sins and uh, gives us a new life and a new hope through Jesus. And we give thanks that you gave us this wonderful gift and uh, we give thanks for your son Jesus and it's in, in his name we pray. Amen.
God blesses us in many ways, and um, you know the the greatest blessing is you know His Son Jesus and and His salvation that He brings through us. But um, as a church, as we minister to others, as we minister to each other, as we share the word in this community, um, it takes gifts from you to make that happen. And so uh, this is our opportunity to to make those gifts. Um, and after this, we're going to give our opportunity to the, the, the kids to give their gift, and uh, then we'll go to praise kids. So let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for all your many blessings, and, um, and again, for your son Jesus. And as we do your work, to do your will the best that we can, we, we, we give these gifts, and, and we pray that they can be used... Uh, wisely and uh, for in order to your ministry to affect this community and in Lake Jackson and, and everywhere that we try to reach and, and go and do good things and, and help us help us to not only to, to, to do that, to know how to do that, to do your will in the community, to to share your word to others and to minister to others so that that each of us can be uplifted and we can uplift others and and, and share your good news with them. Um, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, come down. Let's do the, the kids' gift. I'll be staying for this next song.
This morning I will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israel, Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what is being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of one, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Thank you for that reading, Ian. That we would be changed, that we would be changed from one glory to the next. I've referred to this moment in my life uh, earlier in this series. Um, I was 12 years old. We had come back uh, from Australia, a, a year of uh, changing of viewpoints on, on the world and on sin and sin's impact in my life. And I was ready to put the Lord on in baptism. And it was a great Wednesday night in January. It was cold as it could be outside. The north wind was blowing at the Western Hills Church of Christ. And at the Western Hills Church of Christ, the, the wind would blow right across the entry doors. If you didn't hang on to the door well enough, it'd just kind of blow the door open. And, but inside it was warm because it was full of people that loved me and full of of people whose footsteps I had seen and observed and wanted to walk in and had already kind of set my path on the idea that that's how I, where I wanted my life to go. And my dad and I went up to the baptistry. My dad was the first person that I had ever seen that didn't put waiters on to do a baptism. He just brought his swimsuit. He thought that was good enough. I've adopted that on numerous occasions now. By the way, our waiters leak if I ever come out and, you, and I don't have dark pants on. Don't, don't think something terrible went on. So, He dropped me into that water and raised me back up. He had spoken the words of forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit over me. And he spoke welcome into new life, welcome into the family of God as I came up out of the water. And there were people that were, uh, again, I've described the baptistry where I grew up, and it was way high, so there was no, no way in which anybody could be near down here. In reality, it was very hard to see over the top of the baptistry and see the audience at all. You could see the people in the nursery who were waving to you at the very back, in the second-story nursery. Came up out of the water, and there were a couple of folks that had kind of come to help us change and have towels handy and things like that. Welcome, welcome, congratulations, so proud of you. And then this phrase came out, and I'll never forget it. How does it feel? How does it feel to be washed clean? And it was at that moment that Satan used that opportune time to plant in my heart this thought. Well, it's good to feel clean now, but... I'm sure that I'll mess it up before the day is over. That sense that I wasn't really claimed by God, that the blood of Jesus wasn't really acting in its full effect, not just to draw me to that forgiveness at this moment, but to continually pour out that forgiveness. It was something that really hadn't come to me, it was not part of my heart at that moment. And Satan used it. Satan used it effectively for several years in reality. I'm thankful that that's not where I stayed. I'm thankful that that's not where I am today. It is my hope that in some small way my preaching has led you to a place that is much more about the freedom that we have in Christ. Freedom from sin. Not just that moment of forgiveness, but a true freedom. 
But in reality, sin has its effect. Sin continues to be part of the world that we live in and and if we're honest at all, continues to keep us from reaching all that God would have us to be about. The people, the earliest movers in, in, in our part of the Christian story, the churches of Christ, Barton Stone and Alexander Kamala, were largely motivated by this great call for unity. But a big part of what they conceived of the unity of the Christian to be about, of Christianity to be about, is the people who were moving towards the transformation that God wants to make in their life. That God had intervened in in their lives and that they were joining with the Spirit and bringing about transformation. That you could look and you could see that they weren't just a man or a woman, but they were a man or woman of Christ. That they weren't in reality just an American, but that they were a Christian first and then an American. That God intended to change us, as the passage from 2 Corinthians said, into one glory, into ever-increasing glory, one glory following after another. The world is looking. The world is looking, and to a certain extent, it doesn't think it's real if it's not changing the people who believe the people of faith the people who come together to sing praises who gather together in those buildings that we call churches the world is looking is there really anything different won't you join me in prayer father god we're thankful for this day we're thankful for the way that your love has been poured out in it We're thankful that we have had the opportunity to respond to that love in songs, in the hearing of Scripture, to respond to that love in in taking the bread and the cup and ingesting it to in some very, very real way to be one, renewing that oneness with Christ and increasing that oneness with Christ. He is in us. And to affirm that great truth that we are in Him. Father, we thank You for the forgiveness of sins. We thank You for the gift of the Spirit. We ask that the fruit of forgiveness and the fruit of the Spirit be apparent in our lives as the presence of salt is in the food and is the nature of a lighted city on a dark hill. Father, we repent that we are not finished, that we are not done. We repent that sin still carries its weight in our life. But Father, we come to you and we would ask that you would transform us day by day moment by moment into more and more what you would have us to be we pray that you would speak to us today and that in hearing we would be changed pray this in your son's name and we all say Last week we talked about that first kind of essential. The distinctive of what is it to be Christian as opposed to just the idea that we are uh, in that part of Christianity called the churches of Christ. But what is it to be distinctly Christian? And that I put forward the idea that the first distinctive is to be that ambassador, to be that witness. That from the moment that we take faith in in Christ, from the moment that we trust in God's story, from the moment that we see the resurrection and we say, that is real, that we are to be people who proclaim it, who speak it, 
whose lives point to God, for people to know what has made the difference for us. Again, let's look at those last words of Jesus that the Gospel of Matthew records for us. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go, go proclaim, go be that witness, and go and bring people into that life of following Christ, to be discipled and to be a disciple. Because it's not just about witness, we have to affirm that the true distinctives of the people of God are to be that going and proclaiming that we're going to not stay where we are as if something was to be held on to by us, but we are to go and share it, to go proclaim. And as we go, and as we are that witness, not waiting for this to happen, but as we go and witness, as we point to God to be transformed, to be discipled, and to disciple others into what God would have us to be about. Again, I would say to you that from the minute that Jesus came to the earth, and in reality you can see several conversations that go on during the Gospels as Jesus is walking and talking in His ministry. People will come up and say, what's different? They may say to Jesus, we see something different about you, but they also say, we see your followers and what's different about them. The world is looking. The world has always looked. And the world will continue to look and ask, is it real? Is what they're pointing to real? Does it really make a difference for them? Are we being changed into what God would have us to be? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And let's hear Paul's call to discipleship and to see what it meant to him. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, this outward stuff. And again, this is, this is a somewhat contrary kind of philosophy to the ideas that, that gr the Greeks of his day had. The Greeks believed that the, the spirit could be in one place and the body be in another. There was this kind of dualism, this division. Paul says, according to God, it is all one thing. So we don't just take our spirits and have them transformed. And again, you can hear the language of conversion. To receive the Holy Spirit, to receive forgiveness, our souls cleansed. But Paul says, that cleansing of spirit impacts body. Take your bodies as a living sacrifice. They are to become holy and acceptable to God. And this is, notice the connection. The spiritual worship is about bringing our lives, what we live, our day in, day out walk, into alignment with what God has created in our souls. Continue. Verse 2, do not be. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul calls us to a transformation. He calls us to understand that we are in the process of becoming what God, becoming on the exterior, what God has already created on the interior. If we believe the teaching of forgiveness, we believe that it is a cleansing, and not just a one-time cleansing, but a kind of a continual outpouring of cleansing. God has done that. It is a given as far as His perspective of our soul being fitted for heaven at that moment. But that a process is continually going, ongoing, continuing to go on in our lives. Not just once, not just when we're young, not just when we're transitioning from those, those teenage days into adulthood. Not at any one particular moment, but an ongoing process of transformation. Paul is calling us to kind of refute the laws of thermodynamics applied to our lives. 
The laws of thermodynamics say that everything's decaying. Everything is breaking down as opposed to building up. And we can see it all over the place. Lives that are conformed to what the world says is valuable. Lives that are conformed to worshiping self. And then ultimately what that becomes is worshiping the evil that is behind selfishness. That degradation that can go on. That natural kind of inclination to just continually sort of become less and become less of who we're supposed to be. Paul says refute that. You are a creation of God. You bear His image. And you particularly, not just humankind, but you particularly who have heard the message of Christ, who have heard the defeat of death through the resurrection of Jesus, defeat death in your living. Defeat death in the way that you behave. Defeat that death in the way that you live. Defeat death with every moment that you invite the Spirit to partner with you in not being what is natural, not being what is selfish, not being what is greedy, not being what is covetous, not being what is sacrilegious and unholy, but being what God has made you to be. So what does being transformed mean to me? First of all, I believe that it's essential, that the essential nature of repentance and confession is the first step towards any real transformation that God wants to do within us. By the way, I, I'm not talking about the idea that I have to be about the process of God can't forgive me unless I've asked for forgiveness of something, confessed a sin. But in a broad stroke, in a broad brush stroke, our prayers, our lives, each day, maybe even each moment of each day, should begin with the idea that I am not everything that you want me to be. And if we are unwilling to live in that kind of repentant heart, that confessional heart. And yes, by the way, that needs to find its way into our relationships. That needs to find its way into individual times where we talk with each other and we share our struggles. And we admit, we confess, that I'm not where, I want, where God wants me to be. That we repent, that we have misunderstood that the darkness that Satan wants to to cover us with, that He has shrouded the world in, has in some way shrouded our eyes, and we, we see now something that's different. It is to say those almost unfathomable words, I'm wrong. Let's just practice again. I know that this doesn't apply to all of you. And I know that none of you really have a problem with saying this, but let's just practice this together. Won't you say it with me? I'm wrong. I have been wrong. Say it with me. I have been wrong. I want what God wants. And it may even be that you like Paul. Talk about somebody who understood transformation. Whose love for God never wavered. It was always this intense, consuming love for God, except that what he realized is that he was blind to the greatest reality of God, that is, his revelation through Jesus Christ. Paul says, I was wrong. And I want to move in a new direction. And maybe you and I kind of join with him. And we've been to church all our lives, we've read our Bible all our lives. We have witnessed to the truth of Scripture. We have proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe even all around the world we've done that. And yet, we come to this place where we realize that how we understood what God wanted to be manifest in our life was not complete yet. And we have to say, with me please, I have been wrong. And God, I want you to take me where you want me to be, to transform me. Secondly, we need to be people who continually hear God's word for me. 
It's an incredible temptation. And, and I'm not exactly sure what it is that as a churchgoer through all my life has been kind of mixed in with the water, kind of mixed in there where as I drink it, I become more and more callous to the idea. And what I see is I read scripture and I say, boy, that's right, the world has really got that wrong. Well, I hope God will straighten that person out or that person out. What he calls us to is to hear his word and say, how does it speak to me? And not just the sense of what does he want to teach me in the sense of let me learn something more. Let me have a more developed theology. Let me understand this holiness of God in a greater way. But his word wants to speak change into my life. If my steps have been in this direction, he wants them here. And he is speaking to me. And I want to hear. And finally, what this being transformed means to me, and maybe, maybe you step into this with me, that we don't lose sight of our true standard. Again, as somebody who has been to church all my life, it just kind of gets mixed into the water. As long as I'm better than them. As long as I'm not getting it as wrong as they do. As long as my racism isn't as bad as theirs is. As long as my greed is not as profound as their greed is. As long as my lust doesn't look like their lust. Then I must be okay. Except there's a problem with that. God doesn't say, be holy-er than your neighbor. God says, be holy as I am holy. And when Jesus came and walked and talked on the earth, he was that ultimate, reflect, ultimate reflection of God, ultimate revelation of God. And when we start feeling good about, boy, I've got it together now, Lord. Let's go back to the gospel once again and to hear what true sacrificial love looks like and to hear what a holiness that is begot from God, not from a contrast with the neighbors, looks like. Corporately, I want to invite you. If you're interested in that transformation in your life, there's a couple of things going on on an ongoing basis here. They always are going on. And you might say, well, it's a little inconvenient. It's a little bit tough. I've got to get up an hour earlier. I've got to give one more night and those kind of things. And God doesn't really require that of me. And you know what? You're right. But what I can promise you is the opportunity of Bible classes and life groups are transformative in your life. And should you let them become part of your habit, I believe that you will be changed. And by the way, not just that you're going to know a little more. But if you will hear God through the teachers and hear God through the discussion, you'll find Him calling you to what He wants you to be. And I, I, I shouldn't even have to speak this. But for those of us with children, what are we hoping if they don't see us bringing them to this unique opportunity that is so incredibly age appropriate called our Bible classes? I hope you bring your children and I hope your children see you being changed. It is my prayer that corporately we would also evidence transformation in our practice. That means it can't all stay the same all the time. At some point, we moved from the idea that the Lord's Supper would simply be a prayer that happened or a reading from Scripture before we passed the trays to, to the opportunity for people to share story. This is what it means to me. This is how it's changed me. This is how it has affected my life. And we changed kind of the flow of the service. We added minutes because we wanted to allow time for those things. 
our services, our structures should change because God calls us to be a transformed people individually and corporately. And it is my prayer that purposeful discipleship is a constant part of your life. That you can point to people that you are taking the time to be discipled by and people that you're giving time to disciple. It takes all kinds of forms. It doesn't have to be a formal sit down. But the names of those folks should be on the tips of our tongues. Women discipling women, men discipling men, old discipling young, and I'm blown away when those of you have walked this path so much longer than I have, with so much more endurance than I have, would say even to me, thank you for helping me in my journey. Let's just go for just a couple of minutes to again to those first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created. From the moment God's story starts, He takes the chaos of pre-creation and puts it in order in a way in which you and I can be blessed by it and reveals His glory exponentially around every single corner. Jesus then, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, is asked, what is the greatest? And he says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. To love the Lord is a witness, to point to God. That's who I love. That's where my life is focused. But then it is called to be transformed, to take all of us, not just a part of us, not just a little of us, but to take all of us and be shaped into what God would have it be about. And finally, that that love for God would become a love for neighbor. Jesus links Deuteronomy 6 with Leviticus chapter 19 and says, Love your neighbor. There are all these stories, and it's some of the most foreign images from the gospel that we run into. Jesus interacts with these people that are described as being possessed by demons. And what I'm about to say could be misunderstood in a lot of different ways. But I want to simply point to the image of someone whose life is being destroyed, is being harmed, is being hurt by the presence of a spirit that is, that is contrary to God, what God would want. Jesus comes and relieves them and they move from being someone who can't control their actions, who can't control what they're saying. Some of the demons even beat their bodies, hurting themselves. And Jesus relieves them of this demon and replaces it, brings them back to the mind that God wanted them to have. You know, we don't see it that way. And again, I don't want to be heard as saying that in some way, activity that is contrary to what God would have us be about is some sort of full manifestation of a demon being possessing our lives in the way that Jesus, in the way that the Gospels describe it in Jesus' ministry. But what is the harm that pornography brings to our lives? What is the harm? that gossip, gossip brings to our lives? What is the harm that greed and selfishness brings to our lives? What is the harm that hatred brings to our lives? Most of the time that's not the way we see it. We just kind of think we're going along with the crowd this is good enough, better than my neighbor. We don't see the way it is destroying our lives. Jesus not only offered forgiveness, the removal of that which drags us down, but he offers the filling of his Holy Spirit. Amen? 
And you and I are invited to continually say, God, more. Pour it into me. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to love my neighbor the way you would have me love them. I want to find your blessing in fuller and fuller measure. I want to be transformed into the likeness, not of the best person I know around here. I want to be transformed into the likeness of your son. Today I want to call you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. As the people of God, as those who have put Jesus on in baptism, you have been given the gift of freedom from sin. And now I ask you and invite you to bring your outer life into greater and greater conformity. I want you to come. I don't necessarily want you to come to this front pew. But I want you to come to your spouse. I want you to come to a good friend. I want you to come to your parents. Parents, I want you to come to your children. And I want you to say that confession. I know I'm not right. In fact, I know there's a... I know I'm wrong. And I want to be more. Would you come to God as we stand and sing? Be still and see everybody here today, especially our visitors. We'd like to recognize you with the gift, if you don't mind, raising your hand at a couple of our ladies that's going to pass out a gift to you. Just our appreciation for you being here. Transformation is what our whole Christian life is about, I think. I'd like to read a short, a short passage from Colossians chapter 3. And even throughout all of the New Testament, there's, there's verses like this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. You've died. That's a transformation, isn't it? Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. That's the whole purpose of what he came for. And he doesn't ask us to do something that he didn't do. Christ was transformed. He was God. He came to earth. Then he went back to be with God. And he's asking us to be transformed from who we are to who he is. Wonderful words. I thank Alan for the, the words that he's given to us. And we'd like to invite those who aren't participating to participate with your 
small groups tonight. It'll be good discussion. I know in my group we've had lots of good discussions as we've done these, and I appreciate the couple of notes. Um, got a note this morning from Yvonne McGlon. Uh, Donald's admitted to the hospital on Friday. He had complications due to his surgery. They found he had labored breathing and he had blood clots in his lungs. So please keep him and Yvonne in the prayers. Prognosis right now, she said, is encouraging, but he's, his treatment's still being determined. And please, no visitors right now. Also, I have another note from the Millers. Um, dear church family, words cannot express the gratitude for all the prayers, calls, texts we received while our grandson was in the hospital. He's home now, he's doing well, he's made a complete recovery. We know that God's hand was in this the whole time. We're so grateful that God has led us to such a loving and caring church. In Christ's love, Jerry and Arlene Miller. And we praise God for that. It's also good to see a few folks here. Uh, Paula, glad you're back from your surgery. Everything went well, I hope. Also good to see David Gotro, an audience. Terry German. I know I'm missing somebody who's probably been out sick, but if you're here, we're glad that you're here. I um, also got a, a note that Jean McCoy is having some medical issues. She's also asking for prayer, so please keep Jean in, in your prayers as well. Also, those that are listed in the caring and sharing, uh, Henry Bagwell, Michael Johnson, Johnny and Phillips, keep those in your prayers. Uh, another note, uh, those of you, and as Alan mentioned, the Sunshine School Thanksgiving Feast is going to be on the 18th. Please encourage those people that are involved with that show up and um, encourage them in that this is a good outreach for us the children that come here to learn the parents most of them are not members of the congregation so let, let's show them that that transformation that we've got that love for them uh, one note that kim gave me is the caring and sharing says the sign-up sheets for that are out in the foyer actually they're not they're on the wall outside the kitchen, so if you need to sign up and, and bring some things, please notice that change. Any other announcements that I missed? Okay, let's bow in prayer. Father, we're grateful. We're so grateful that Jesus was transformed for us, that you sent him here, that you asked him to become a human being and that he spent his life here trying to help us to understand who you are and that you love us so much. Father, as our lives grow, help us to, to go through that transformation. Help us to show that to others and they can see it. That this is what you do when one dedicates their life to you. That we change, we become more like you, and we want others to do the same. Father, we'd ask that you'd watch over our brothers and sisters that are hurting. Please continue to, to be with Don McGlon as he's had complications from his surgery. And we'd ask that you guide the doctors that are working with him. Also be with Henry Bagwell, with Michael Johnson, with Johnny and Phillips. We're grateful for those who are back with us that have had surgeries or have been out for some other reason for sickness. Father, we're grateful that the Millers Grandbaby is home and he's doing so well. We know that your hand helped him through the difficulties there. And we'd ask that you continue to be with his parents as they help him to grow and, and become a child of yours. Father, bless us. Bless our, our small groups tonight. Help them to discuss the things that you would have us to learn about how we can be transformed and how we can show that transformation to others and bring them to you because that's the reason that we're here. Please go on with us through our lives, Father. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's all be standing for our closing song, please. First John 4, 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Let's sing this together. Love, what a love. 